Well, welcome to Malcolm Bly Turnbull, 29th Prime Minister of Australia. Uh, thank you for joining us here for the Western Sydney Unfiltered, sir. Okay, great to be with you. The, um, I suppose the subject of our discussion today uh, is, of course, um, this very book, Malcolm Turnbull, A Bigger Picture. There is, uh, you are an author, you're a family of authors, both you and Lucy are prodigious writers. Um, I do remember a famous Whitlam quote when he was presented with all of his cabinet who just released tomes, to which I think the former Prime Minister wrote, these bastards are writing more books than they've read. Um, <laughs> but between the two of you, you have added to, uh, I have one of Lucy's great copies of her original time on, the, on, on Sydney where she, we have fun talking about, she included the Western Suburbs starting at Balmain. Um, I think she's redefined that in her later later okay. life as an urbanist. Um, but maybe starting there, I think you've had you've done a lot of media about your book, uh, a lot of salacious bits that people have enjoyed. Uh, I think we'll be staying away from most of that today. I'd rather talk about policy, which is all too rarely done in Australian media context. But also, I think one of the bits missed, you've dedicated this book to Lucy. Mm. And in a way, this has been one of the great political partnerships and love affairs of, of Australia, um, this long-term relationship as partners in urbanism, which has affected us in Western Sydney particularly, where, where where do you pitch that partnership to talk to others about how you've kept this this wonderful partnering marriage for so many years in the, in the public spotlight? What do you put that down to, apart from a very uh, accommodating wife? <laughs> well, I mean, you provided the answer. Um, no, I, well, we're very good friends, um, and that's the you know that's the great. The great thing. I mean, I'm always happiest when I'm with Lucy. She always makes me laugh. Uh, she's uh, she sort of lights up any room she comes into, at least for me. And I uh, and so we're just really, really good friends. And that's you know just we've been very lucky uh, to have found each other. And you know we've been married for over forty years now, and together for a few years longer than that. So it's quite a long uh, partnership. And and as you say, we've we've done a lot of things together, a lot of business, you know, apart from you know being married and having family together, and done a lot of uh, business and other adventures together. And we share a passion about cities, and uh, <clears throat> you know, as I acknowledge in my book, you know, Lucy was very influential in uh, my thinking on cities policy, and you know, the reforms that I brought in on. City's policy, which you know, one one feature of which are the city deals, and we have, of course, the Western Sydney city deal. These are these are very big shifts in uh, city's pol well, city's policy from the Commonwealth's point of view. I mean, I think from a coalition perspective, I don't think there had act there actually had been a city's policy, at least as far as I can recall. Well, I think it's fair to say you're the the first Liberal Prime Minister who broke that nexus of. Labor being very urban focused, and sometimes Liberal Prime Ministers seeing it more as a rural development agency, Canberra. And do you think, as part of your legacy now that you've enshrined a spirit within the coalition that it needs to be remained in the, the business of cities, not only as a, a bank to fund a, a train line, but more active partner in, in that urban regeneration? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the, the, city's, the city's policy had, you know, had strong support. Uh, the uh, and and maintains it. Um, the I'd also say the other kind of um, sacred cow that we slew uh, was um, the one about public transport. You know, the coalition had never uh, been interested in funding uh, mass transit, and I'm you know I'm, I remember back in John Howard's day <clears throat> when I was arguing for this. You know, the case being put to me that, uh, you know, that we shouldn't fund mass transit because it was a state government responsibility and once you got your feet on the sticky paper, you'd never get it off. And, you know, so it wasn't... And, you know, Howard had that view. Abbott absolutely had that view. Uh, but I always thought it was bizarre. They did like a road. Yeah, but I always thought it was bizarre because, you know, you... you um, If you, as I... Again, you know... You would have read this in the book, but I mean, it's it's obvious. When I used to talk to state government ministers and Gladys Berejiklian, when she was shadow transport and then transport minister, or a treasurer, I should say, and uh, and then before that, transport minister. I mean, Gladys used to make the point that 
you know, if the Commonwealth comes along and says, we'll provide 80% of the money for a road, but 0% of the money for a railway line, from a state government's point of view, it's a no-brainer. Because the truth is, no matter how much money the feds put into urban infrastructure, almost invariably, the state gets all the credit for it because they are, you know, they're on the spot. And so, you know, essentially what was happening was you, it was far from relieving the state government of uh, expense that it would, that, that it could then on roads that it could then spend on rail. What it was doing was multiplying the effectiveness of state government resources on roads. So we ended up getting more roads and less rail. And, you know, you've obviously got to have a, a you know, an objective, pragmatic, uh, non you know, uh, sec non-mode biased, uh, you know, uh, uh, approach to funding transport. And you've got to, you know, you're clearly you need roads, clearly you need rail, clearly you need active uh, transport corridors for cyclists. And as Lucy always uh, maintains, you've got to make sure your cities are walkable. And I was there the day out at Western Sydney Uni when you and Premier Berejiklian and eight mayors signed the Western Sydney City Deal. That's a right. very hot day in, in the West, if I remember rightly. Uh, yeah. With my drama up to the night before, whether it would be signed based on a bit of chicanery of some people involved in the process. But it was the first true city deal uh, beyond a single stadium in Townsville and a hospital in, 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 in Tassie. Are you look back in the short period since, are you comfortable with the development of that as a governance model? Do you see it continuing out well, of Canberra well, and growing? Challenge, the challenge, Christopher, is to main, for the Commonwealth to maintain a high level of interest. Um, you know, the, um, it's, uh, that, that's the, that, that is, that, that's always going to be the challenge. Um, the approach in the Department of Infrastructure historically had always, in Canberra, I mean, had always been just to kick the money out the door. They actually used to use that language, which I used to appall me. Uh, and when I used to say back in the Howard era, well, we should be investing in infrastructure, they'd say, well, you know, then we'd have to appoint directors to the boards, we'd have to be involved, be so much trouble. Isn't well, it as a former director of the Moore Bank at a modal company, I'm glad you won that debate. And yeah, but it was, it was take off. crazy, you know. And so, so the bottom line is you've got to do more than just make grants. You've got to be a, an yep. investor. You've got to be an intelligent participant. Grants have a role, but... You know, there's no substitute for having a bit of skin in the game because it gives you a continuing interest. And so, you know, and there was like the, some bizarre things going on. I mean, when I became Prime Minister, the uh, Western Sydney Airport was, you know, was on the agenda and as it had been for decades. But what was being contemplated was giving a about a $2 billion soft loan to Sydney Airport Corporation to build the second airport, to encourage them to build the second airport, which naturally they would build as slowly as they possibly could because the last thing they want to have is competition in airports in the Sydney Basin. And, you know, it was madness. The idea that you would have, you would give Sydney Airport the second, the right to build the second airport, but of course that's what, what had been done when in the Howard era they sold Sydney Airport to you know, the Macquarie Bank and others who bought it. Like, it just, it was crackers. Anyway, the only way to solve it was for the Commonwealth to build it itself, which is what is happening. So the out, upshot of that is that at some, you know, it should be finished by 26. Uh, and at some point after that, it may be that the Commonwealth uh, will sell it uh, to someone. Uh, but but that person... And now the Commonwealth's uh, investing in the train line to link it as well. Yeah. So well, that was part of the... Taking that deal. further. Mm. Part of the deal I did with Gladys was that we would fund that train line, that north-south train line, uh, 50% each. Well, as the convener of the former Western Sydney Rail Alliance, thank you, sir. We were... It was a, it was a great announcement. And uh, well, see, places like very, the Science Park and others will now be linked to the airport. Yeah. Well, and, and Christopher, I was very concerned that we build that line because it's a city shaping line, it actually, it, and you, you know, you will be, it will enable development in that all of those areas between the airport and, um, you know, Penrith and so forth. And hopefully uh, towards Campbelltown as well. Yeah, yeah, it's got to go south down to Campbelltown in due course. But the, but the point is, that's, that is, you've got to, the, I think the, 
the um, uh, what would I say? The instinct uh, of the state government was simply to build a line from Parramatta up to the airport, and that's and you know this is the this is the <laughs> gets back to to Lucy again and her vision for and the Sid, Greater Sydney Commission's vision for three cities, because otherwise, if all you do is have lines going out from the centre from Sydney, which of the city of Sydney, the CBD, which of course is not at the centre of Sydney, Sydney, on the eastern perimeter of it, um, you know, you, you you keep on compounding the problem. I mean, you've got to, you've and of course you've got to have linear infrastructure that goes from you know west to east. Not, I'm not arguing with that. But north south is what's always held back. You've got to have north south. development. Correct, because yeah. otherwise you're just a series of. It, it's I mean it's the same point I used to make in terms of the geopolitics of. Southeast Asia and or this hemisphere, the whole uh, East Asian hemisphere, the um, you've got to have a linkages between all the countries in the region so that it's a mosaic, not just a series of spokes going into imperial hubs. Well, speaking of intractable problems for Western Sydney, one of them is, of course, our heat islands. Uh, yeah. You famously, infamously, you know, would point to two stints at the end of your leadership being both both tied back to climate change and uh, those mm. who opposed your more yes. progressive views on it. Mm. Uh, you know, climate change for some is just an esoteric, nice scientific concept. But as you point out in the book, uh, the day you were writing the conclusion, Penrith was the hottest city in the world early this year in January. The heat islands that affect Western Sydney are, are very significant. Mm. Are you more confident, and I won't go because I won't be able to go head to toe with you on the technical nature of climate change, but in a political legacy sense, are you confident that your legacy will sustain, there will be a greater embrace and understanding of the need for real action on climate change affecting communities like ours across Western Sydney? Well, uh, you look, I hope so, Chris. I think the... Um there is a profound problem within the Liberal National Party coalition that there is this, um, you know, right-wing element, populist right-wing element, you know, backed in by the uh, that part of the press, mostly owned by Murdoch, which is into climate denialism, you know. And, you, I mean, you, you take Matt Keane, right, you know, young uh, energy minister yep. in Gladys's government, uh, he, every now and then, he well regularly he makes perfectly sensible statements about climate change and energy, and he um, and he is uh, he um, um, gets uh, sla- you know attacked savagely by really the, badly by the you know Murdoch press for it. I mean, like truly bizarre. So I, I mean, I I think that is a problem that there is a real profound problem inside the coalition. But nonetheless, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of things working in our favour. Um, you know, technology as a result, improvements in technology have resulted in solar and and uh, wind, to a lesser extent, getting cheap, so much cheaper than they had been. Um, You'd be delighted to know we issued a paper uh, uh, last year called The Hot Issue, addressing very much the issues not only of heat islands in Western Sydney, but but uh, in a way we can recycle and use water more yeah, appropriately. Yeah. I know you're a famous kayaker on Sydney Harbour and uh, you ought to be applauded for that athletic pursuit. Um, I suppose our ambition is that the, the people of Penrith have as much right to access recreational water as those of Balmoral and Bondi. Well, uh, well, you can't well, have a great river city, centre yeah. of a city, and have the rivers untouchable and unapproachable. No, so, no, no. Uh, Chris, you've got, you've got to have all of those things. And... and the bottom line, I mean, getting around to Batka Heat Islands, I mean, the key in in is you need to have um, you need to have a much greener uh, environment. You need to have a lot more trees planted. Uh, there's no substitute for shade, um, and that's you know that's going to be vital. And I think that you know there's a, so much that can be done in terms of uh, renewable renewables generally. You know, so I, I think we're I I, I think. I think the, if you like, the technology and the industry yep. and the community are way ahead of the coalition party room in Canberra, which is still held hostage by this right wing group that that is sustained by, you know, their friends in the media. 
and I think, um, sadly, a, a smaller but rising element within Labor that is still a little coal dependent. So, look, there's two other great issues around Western Sydney in which you had significant engagement. Um, I shared, I was one of your, you know, ambassadors for the Republican movement back in that wonderful crusade. We didn't quite get there, but we gave it a good shot. But if you look across Western Sydney in the vote on marriage equality, in the vote on the, Australia want to become a republic, albeit a, a wrong question, but and probably whether a vote had gone to a referendum on Indigenous constitutional reform. The first two, certainly on the latte line, as we call it, the other side, the southwest side of Sydney, all voted against a republic, against marriage equality, and would would likely, despite the large Aboriginal community in Western Sydney, vote against those things. How do we, you know, you know, the progressive issues you championed that not only are Labor Liberal issue, they're a, they're a societal mix. How do we help bring a Western Sydney community along that is socially conservative on some of those progressive issues? Well, I, I, I think they're all, you've got to deal with them one at a time. I think with the Republic, the, the, the basically the yes vote, the, the electorates that had, the, the more educated, uh, you know, the more people with... Uh, you know, tertiary degrees, uh, the more knowledge workers in electorates, the more likely they were to vote yes. I mean, um, our pollster uh, said he had never seen an, a, an issue that was so uh, calibrated on levels of education. And the reason for that was, I think, that where you've got a, a, a constitutional amendment, uh, you've got compulsory voting. Um, if your opponents are able to confuse or mislead uh, or create anxiety about the nature of a change, the less you understand about the change, the more likely you are to vote no. That's it. so. You know, there's a there's a, you know in America they have this term low information voters, which you know broadly speaking, you know coincides with whether people have got college degrees or not. But I mean, not not. I mean, this is generalizing massively and misleadingly as a result. But anyway, I think that was the big issue with that one. Uh, I think with gay marriage, uh, it was a, it was different. Um, I think there you've got in, uh, I mean, Western Sydney was the, uh, there are a couple of electorates in Western Sydney where the no vote was quite large. And I think that is largely because of, um, you know, communities, migrant communities, which are more socially conservative, whether that be Muslim communities, whether it be the Middle Eastern Christians, who are also very conservative on this issue, as I know. Well, uh, Chinese also, Christian some conservative. Of the, some of the yeah, Chinese communities. I mean, it, again, it depends very much. I mean, Taiwan has legalised same-sex marriage. So, <clears throat> you know, you've got to, again, you've got to be very careful about generalising wildly and putting people into categories. But, you know, it is significant that the largest no votes were in uh, a couple of electorates in Western Sydney, the seat of Caldwell in Victoria, similar type of uh, composition. And then other than that, the only electorates that voted no voted no by very, very fine margins. I mean, you know, even in uh, Queensland, uh, the electorate of Maranoa, which is... You know, thought. West, West <laughs> Out in Roma. <laughs> no, no, well, I mean, they voted no, but only by a few percent. You know, Toowoomba, uh, the seat of Groom, which has got a very, very, very conservative Christian sort of, uh, you know, uh, part of the community there, um, and it's got some of the most active, uh, you know, that guy, Lyle Shelton, you know, the yeah, leader of Christian the... Lobby. Christian lobby, you know, who was leading the no case, he comes from Toowoomba, it voted no, but, you know, my recollection is by half a percent, you know. Upon so, the Darling Downs. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 but bottom line is that, I mean, Queensland, oddly enough, had a higher yes vote than New South Wales, you know. Th things have turned. Hey, yeah, so, so, so your book obviously documents your, the, your history up to and including to the present, which is the case. One question that's happened since the publication of the book I'd like to go to and get your perspective. Um, you delivered for us uh, the first Lachlan Macquarie lecture 
about a vision for Western Sydney. Yeah. And on the same day, you presented to our friends for the Bankstown Poetry Slam the first MOA prize to recognise community advocacy. So we've always seen the two. I'm a fan of both of them in Western Sydney. How do we, in the, in the statue debate, in Black Lives Matter and others, how are we to judge a Lachlan Macquarie now against both his progressive for the time policies, but eventually sending effectively hit squads out from Indigenous community? Is it simply by putting more statues up of the Pemawais rather than ripping the others down? How are we to measure the art against the artist, the historical context? Well, I mean, I think you. I, I think the reality is that uh, all of these people are part of our history, uh, and you know, you you've got to. You you know, Macquarie was a very important uh, builder, leader whose contribution was overall. Original urbanist in Australia. Yeah. Our contribution was overall very positive, uh, but you know the impact of European settlement on uh, first Australian civilization was absolutely cataclysmic. You know we can't get around that. I mean the you know the the, the Sydney communities, the devastation of the Sydney communities from disease, let alone uh, you know physical violence alone uh, in the first uh, few years of the settlement is a, just a shocking story. I mean terrible. Terrible, uh, uh, you know, accounts. Anyway, um, I, look, I think the point is that you've got to be clear-eyed about your history. Uh, you've got to, uh, I think, honesty is the most important thing. I'm not a fan of pulling down statues. Uh, I think some, I think statue, a statue of a political leader is a piece of political speech. It's a piece of political propaganda in that sense. Uh, and you can legitimately argue that you should move one, move them from time to time. I mean, you know, do you do you want to have you know this particular po political leader in pride of place always? I mean, you know that. Are the people of Wentworth rallying around for one now is 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 Watson's <laughs> no, Bay going to have? No, no, I think we're I think we're um, I think we're beyond. We're not sort of into statues very much nowadays, but the. Uh, but you know, I mean, for example, I mean, I'll give you I'll give you an example. So the so all of these statues in the United States, in the southern United States, of Civil War generals and so forth, seemingly always on a horse. Yeah, they were erected in the most of them in the first few decades of the twentieth century, hmm. and they were part of a statement, an affirmation of white supremacy which had been re-won after the period of Reconstruction, after the American Civil War, when African-Americans, you know, the liberated slaves, emancipated slaves were given the vote. And, uh, you know, they, over time, through a whole series of measures and chicanery and threats and violence, uh, white majorities got control again. And so those, those statues do more than just commemorate people who rebelled against the United States of America, right, literally were, were literally rebels and, you know, technically could all have been, uh, you know, executed for treason. Uh, they not only represented people that did that, but they represented in, a, in some respects in a more sinister way the negation of equal rights of the rights of African Americans, uh, you know, in and, and denial of their constitutional rights in practical terms, uh, including by segregation, after long after the Civil War had happened. So, you know, those sort of statues are just, uh, you know, I mean, they are just dripping with politics, dripping with partisan politics. Then you get... Um, but, you know, a guy, I mean, we, we tend not to have that, you know, our history has not been that conflictual, thankfully. There's been plenty of conflict, but not to that level. And, you know, I, I think we're, given that we don't have a lot of statues and monuments in Australia, I think what we're better off is, uh, is contextualising them properly. I mean, one of Lucy's uh, points that she often makes is that, you know, you've got a statue of Matthew Flinders in Sydney, and you've got a statue of, you know, circumnavigated Australia, etc., uh, and you've got a statue of his cat. His cat, little, yes. But you don't have a statue of Bungari, who was his uh, Aboriginal, you know, companion, who he went round 
uh, Australia with. Now, Maybe you can join me at the unveiling of the Pemawai statue yeah. that we're going to make our ambition to, to think, recognise the initial warrior. I, I, think, well, I, I think you should, and I, I think you should, because all of these, I mean, I think we've got, and I think, but you can also move things. I mean, uh, there's a very good example in um, <clears throat> in London, uh, in Whitehall, you know, which is the sort of big imperial street that runs up from Parliament up to Trafalgar Square, you've got um, a statue of Robert Clive, Clive of India, who was one of the most rapacious, villainous, murderous leaders of the East India Company that raped and pillaged Bengal and began... You know, it was it was a company town. <laughs> he was, mate. He was, and he was, he was excoriated uh, in his time. He was called out for his depredations in, you know, the late eighteenth century. Uh, at the time, he was not a hero in uh, in the UK at the time. Quite the contrary, he was sort of seen as a you know criminal, basically, in many quarters. Anyway, they. Whack a statue up of him in the early 20th century when the British Empire and the British Raj was at its height, Clive of India. Well, as William Dalrymple, you know, now people are saying it shouldn't, it should be taken down. Well, as William Dalrymple said, it would never have been put up in his life or at the time of his death. Uh, but but maybe the argument is to say, well, you know what, he's had a nice run there in Whitehall. Maybe we'll move him somewhere else into the That pillar could be better used. We might have you know, something uh, that's a bit more appropriate. I, I, I think there's always... David, David Beckham could now take the spot. Well, you know, or maybe Gandhi, I don't know. You know, maybe uh, uh, Nehru or something, you know. But, but the, point is, the point is that you can legitimately... The, the thing is you can move monuments and you can, you can tear them down if you want to. You can move monuments, but I think what you're better off doing is is recognising your history, being open-minded about it, and where possible, if you've got a monument that people have got some affection for, then contextualising it, you know, and with other, other, you know, statuary or whatever. So, it's a, it, look, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic, but the truth is our cities are not cluttered with, uh, with statues by any means. As I said, in your uh, quite remarkable tome, and I strongly encourage whether you want to read the thick tome, whether you want to go full Malcolm as I did and have Malcolm read it to you on, on Audible, whichever way you, you, you consume your literature. Um, you, you basically document tale of both achievement and bastardry in equal or variant mm -hmm. measures at different times of your corporate and political and media careers. Looking back on all of it, and it's, it's not dissimilar to a question I asked your darling wife because you're the first husband and wife team interviewed on Western Sydney Unfiltered. Right. Um, do you, would you encourage now pe young people of capacity, of ambition and vision to still seek the noble profession of politics? Or do you think with everything you've been through a couple of times, is yeah. there other ways that they could better uh, live out their policy ambition and to impact on their society? Where, where, do you, where are you left with that experience? <coughs> well, Chris, look. Um, someone who never I mean, did you know, like me, someone yeah. who did like you. So it's a... Yeah, no, but you, you know this from your own family's experience. I mean, the, the bottom line is that uh, history is made by those who turn up uh, and, you know, the, the responsibility and opportunity that people who are in parliament can form governments, can make laws is enormous. Um, but it is not the only... They're not the only people that do politics. I mean, I've always objected to the sort of um, idea that politics is like uh, football where the only people who are playing the game are those on the field, i.e. the parliamentarians and everyone else is in the stands. I'm a firm believer in active citizenship and I think you can have a lot of impact uh, on, your, you know, the politics, the, the amenity, whatever, the opportunities of your community and your nation outside of parliamentary politics. But I wouldn't discourage anyone from going into parliament, from running for parliament. I think it's the more good people that put their hand up, the better. But uh, it, ha it has a lot of, you know, it's, it's a rough business. Now, I mean, there are lots of other lines of work that are rough too, by the way. But as we both know, um, the politicians are pretty well paid. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they always complain about the money they're paid, but they're paid well over, they're paid, you know, all up 
around three times average uh, full-time earnings. Uh, so the, uh, the you know the money's all right, uh, but the one of the difficulties is in the federal parliament. It's the travel and the isolation. You know the fact that you you I mean if you're a you know if you're a backbencher for example you'd be a, you'd be sleeping in your own bed maybe you know maybe half the year maybe a little bit more. Um, if you're a minister, you'd be lucky to manage one in three, maybe one in four. Now, if you've got a, a family... The impact uh, on families are significant. Absolutely. I mean, you're basically saying to your spouse uh, that they've got to bring the kids up by themselves, uh, which is a pretty, isn't a great deal, you know. I mean, some people are up for it, others aren't. So I think it's a, it's a pretty tough business from a family point of view, but it's more important uh, than ever. Um, and, uh, and, you know, ultimately, if you want to make politicians listen to you, you've got to basically pers- make sure they understand that if they don't listen, you'll vote them out. You know, I mean, people say to me, what would make the coalition, uh, what, what would sort of enable the coalition to get over the climate change sort of phobia and the bullying from the right? I tell you, the thing that would change would be a massive electoral defeat that they ascribe to climate, although it didn't stop the denialists coming back after the loss in 2007. And the other thing would, of course, be uh, the Murdochs changing the position in their media, which would be the fastest way to do it. And I can't resist one last one. If you'd had your druthers and looking at everything you know now, when you're at your political peak, popularity peak in late early, late 16, early 17 type year. Yeah, late 15. Late 15, early early, early 16. Uh, the son of a Labor cabinet minister, the, a former national stakeholder in, in Young Labor, the Bill Shorten and mm. Anastasia Pelder show days and, and long days. I'd have probably ticked the box for M. Turnbull. The Macron type approach, could you have foreseen a time when you might have eschewed those in the right of your party and forced and forged a centrist model and taken others with you? Would, would, well, that, would that forever haunt you of that question yeah, of where to or, or yeah, not? That wouldn't have been the time to do it. Um, I mean, I, I guess the time that I came closest to that was um, in that coup week in August uh, 2018 when I was, uh, I actually went to bed on the Wednesday night uh, convinced that I should, you know, I've decided that I should uh, call an election the next morning. And uh, I, I was, had all the paperwork and everything ready to do that, and I was talked out of it. And, I, and the look, my the, the judgment was right not to do so, because if I had gone to an election, uh, I think, or not, you know, the Labor Party would have won, most almost certainly, uh, but because the coalition was just a, you know, just to, like looked like it was imploding. But what I would have had to do then is run an entirely personal campaign that was both against the Labor and against the right of my own party. Now, that's the kind of thing you're talking about and you've only got to describe it to see that while it sounds heroic, it would be... It would, <laughs> It would be do. It would have cost you more than the one before. Cost yeah, it would have cost. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, that's right. As Lucy said, yeah, and you'll have to pay for it. So, the um, uh, but it was um, but it is it is it's a fundamental. I mean, the the coalition is, as I said, it's held hostage by that right wing group, and um, unfortunately, right wing populism, and you see this obviously, you know, writ large with Trump in the United States, it's not conservative. At all, it seeks to divide rather than unite. Uh, it's absolutely its tactics are antithetical to just about everything we need to do in a multicultural society like Australia. You know, sure, the, the terms left, right are irrelevant compared to globalist nationalists now, as the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, but what we've got to do? I mean, how is it that? And you, you know, Western Sydney is a good example of this. I mean how we have the most successful multicultural society in the world. It is, it's the foundation of that is respect, mutual respect. The minute we uh, start hating each other uh, and, and, and encouraging, you know, hate speech uh, and division, that success of that great Australian project will be frayed. 
that's why Abbott was so such what well, one of the reasons he was such a bad prime minister because he's you know he was always seeking to exploit divisions. He didn't appeal to the better angels in our soul, but to the correct, correct. And you see the problem with that, Chris, is that if you do that, um, yes, you might win an election. Yes, you might get some political advantage. But look at what it does to your country. You know, you have to be, as a leader, you, you have to be constantly working on bringing people together. It is the, you know, so, uh, you well, know. I, I don't think you'd be accused of seeing the bigger picture. Yeah. If you haven't read, ladies and gentlemen, across Western Sydney, get yourself a, get yourself a book, get yourself a tape, have a listen. It's, um, forget the media you've seen about it. it. It certainly talks to the politics and the the exhilarating and ugly nature of politics, which we've again seen this week out of Victoria on the other side of politics. Um, but, but more importantly, it talks to policy and there's not enough talk of policy, particularly in our media. Uh, 29th Prime Minister of Australia, my great hero, Robert Kennedy, always spoke about, uh, quoting Dante, that the, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of great moral crisis choose neutrality. Your career suggests you never you never chose neutrality. Um often to your own, sometimes to your own demise. But thank you, sir, and thank you from Western Sydney between, as I said, the great partnership, the, the Hughes-Turnbull partnership uh, has left indelible mark on the region, not only with an airport um, and transport connected, but with the very nature of recalibrating the debate about the centrality of Western Sydney yeah. to city, that it's, it's that it can be, in fact, the city's solution, not its problem. It's been ever yeah. since Macquarie first put that forward. So... Thank you for your time, sir, and good luck in whatever it is uh, that next you. um, your next adventure. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Yes.